Hi and welcome to 10.1 Electrostatics Introduction and Charge. That is right, we are done with our study of the branch of physics known as mechanics and we are going into the electricity and magnetism section. We're going to start by being able to describe what causes objects to be charged and you'll be able to calculate the charge of an object. That's because we're starting. Electrostatics is the study of stationary electric charges or fields, not electric currents. We're going to do moving electric charges when we do electricity. We are doing static electricity right now. You could think of it like that, stationary electric charges. Unit 11 is when we do circuits and electricity. These charges are often created by rubbing two objects together and transferring electrons from one to another. This unit is all going to be about visualizing the movement of electrons. So a classic example, you take a piece of animal fur, which I have plenty of in the classroom, and then you take some kind of rod. This one is showing an ebonite rod. You could have a rubber rod or a glass rod. Um, and then you rub the two objects together and you create a static charge. You're transferring electrons from one object to another, which means that one object's going to become positive because they lost electrons. One object's going to become negatively charged because they gained electrons. Boom, there you have it, electrostatics in a nutshell. So to start our study of electrostatics, let's go back to the 1700s with who else but Benjamin Franklin. He used a high voltage static electricity generating machine to research electrical phenomenon. The machine consisted of a glass globe which turned on an axis via a crank and a cloth pad in contact with the spinning globe. So you get the same effect of we talked about the animal fur and a rod, if you rub it, you can transfer a charge, and this is a way of transferring charge because you're rubbing the globe on the cloth pad. So the friction between the pad and the glass transferred charge, which was deposited on a set of metal needles, which conducted the charge to what's called a Leyden jar or a high voltage capacitor. So here is showing the metal needles which took the excess charge built up on the glass sphere and transferred it to basically a battery uh, or a Leyden jar. Franklin's experiments with the machine eventually led to new theories about electricity and inventing the lightning rod. So back then they didn't know um, like about protons and electrons, but they were able to see the effects of the moving electrons and build up a charge. So this ended up uh, kind of behaving like a Van de Graaff generator. You might have seen this example before where there's a belt inside of here and a motor turns the belt which rotates um, a pulley inside and builds up a charge uh, and it's collected much the same way with this metal. There's little metal tines in here that build up the charge on the metal sphere. So you're basically just pushing a lot of electrons, excess electrons to the top of this thing. Or maybe you can be taking electrons away from the glass and transferring them away and you're building up a positive charge. They didn't know what was happening. They just saw that there was a charge there and they saw that they could collect it. So this is uh, multiple Leyden jars put together. And you can see this is from the Franklin uh, museum it says Franklin grouped a number of jars into what he described as a battery, which was a military term. By multiplying the number of holding vessels, a stronger charge could be stored and more power would be available on discharge. So through experimentation, it was determined that you could create a charge on a glass rod by rubbing it with silk. You could also create a charge on an amber rod by rubbing it with silk, but it was observed that the charge of the glass was different somehow than the charge of the amber. Again, they didn't know about electrons or anything like that, but they know that they could build up this static charge. And if you rub these two things with silk, 
they would oppose each other. They would repel. So gl charged glass, repelled charged glass, really what would happen is they would like hang these from a wire and then you bring this close to it and this would rotate around and it would repel. Uh, but in my simplified animation here, we just see that it's being repelled. So then you could take amber, which is just petrified tree sap, and it also repels when you charge it up with silk. So right now it seems like, okay, the charge is the same. They both are, it's repelling. It's just some kind of charge here. It's just one charge and it's the same exact phenomenon. But what happens if you bring glass close to charged amber? So if you charge up the glass with the silk and then you charge up the amber with the silk, they were like, well, it should just repel each other, right? Everything repels, great. But what they saw was this time it they attracted. So charged glass attracts charged amber. Again, they didn't know about protons and electrons or anything like that, but they were able to do these experiments, make observations, and they created a convention. Things that were glass-like were deemed positive, and things that were amber-like were deemed negative, meaning if another object was repelled, is charged up and it was repelled by charged glass, that thing is now positive, and if another different object is charged up, and it was repelled by charged amber, that is a like charge and it is negative. So now we know that this charge is being built up because of the transfer of electrons. And in my classroom, I'll use a model. So it's just a very basic model that we use. And I have golf balls that represent electrons. So the blue golf balls are electrons and the red golf balls are protons. The protons for this class in our very simplified model, the protons and the positive charges always remain in place. Those are like the nucleus of the atoms, right? So they're not gonna go anywhere, but the electrons are free to move if let's say you take some silk and you rub the silk the glass loses an electron this electron was transferred to the silk okay and for the amber we could see we have three electrons three protons so i guess you could say we had positive three protons and then negative three electrons and what do you end up with a charge of zero so right now the amber is neutral just like the glass rod was before but again you come along with some silk hmm this amber behaved differently it absorbed an electron now we have three protons still but now we have one two three four negative electrons so overall you could say the net charge is negative one negative one negative one what i guess we could call it negative one elementary charges for now all right that e stands for elementary charges not electrons so you could have this many elementary charges or positive three e positive three elementary charges because the charge of a proton and an electron same amount of charge different mass same amount of charge Okay, so what happened to the glass? The glass lost an electron. So if we do our little calculation that we were doing before, we still have three protons, three positive charges, and now we only have two electrons. So overall, positive three minus two, you get a positive net charge. So the glass became positive when it was neutral, became positive when you rubbed it with the silk, and then the amber gained an electron. So it went from three electrons to four electrons. So overall, the amber had a negative, net negative charge in our very simplified model that we're using, okay? I want you to be able to see in your mind the transfer of the electrons. So give it a little practice, fill in the blank. If a neutral object, we could see this is neutral because there's one, two, three, four, five, six protons. So this is six protons. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six 
we have six electrons. So right now this is a neutral object. And if you want, you could put like E. If a neutral object loses electrons, what's going to happen? It has an overall positive charge, negative charge, or neutral. Pause the video and make an observation. So if you lose the electron, now we still have six. We're never going to really lose our protons, but we only have one, two, three, four, five. So this is negative five. And then overall, six minus five is positive one where I come from. So this is a positively charged object now because whenever you lose electrons, if, if you start out neutral and you lose electrons, you're going to have an overall positive charge. You have more protons than electrons. This is how we should be thinking about this. Now, if a neutral object gains electrons, it has an overall what kind of charge? Pause the video, think about it. Let's get another electron in there. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons now. And then overall, six minus seven is negative one elementary charges. So it becomes an overall net negative object all right and i'm saying net because it remember net is like the sum of the two things okay here's a critical thinking question for you now can one object have a greater charge than another what would affect the size of an object's charge think about the examples that we've seen the rod being rubbed with the animal fur the glass and amber rods being rubbed with silk. How can we create more of a charge or how would we ensure that the object has less of a charge? What, what is affecting the object's charge? Think about it. Well, to answer the first question, an object can have a greater charge than another. I mean, you're transferring in both cases shown here. Have you ever gotten a shock from touching a doorknob or a light switch before? Uh, you're transferring electrons from one object to another, but for lightning, you can lightning transfers so much more electrons than this little shock does. So what's happening there is we're transferring a different number of electrons. So the charge is dependent on the number of electrons that you either have excess of, or maybe you're deficient in electrons you have more protons than electrons in that object neutral objects have about the same protons and electrons same number all right so for this one we're transferring just a few electrons and then you have a negatively charged object for this one you're transferring so many more electrons all right crazy amount of electrons we have to have a way to quantify the number of electrons and describe the size of the charge. What is the magnitude of this charge now? So let's officially start our electrostatics unit by defining what charge is. We use a lowercase q to represent charge, just like we use a lowercase m to represent mass. So that's gonna, the Q is gonna start popping up in our equations now. Um, charge is a characteristic of matter that expresses the extent to which it has more or fewer electrons than protons. So it's all about this imbalance of, do I have more electrons? Do I have a negative charge? Or maybe I'm deficient in electrons and I have more protons than electrons. I have a positive charge. Or maybe I have the same amount. It's not more or fewer. Maybe I have the same amount of electrons and protons. I have zero charge because it's the same amount. Um, that's what we're talking about here. It's a property of matter. Just like mass is a property of matter, charge is a property of matter. So we have the lowercase m is like the base for a lot of the things that we talked about in mechanics. This lowercase q is going to be the base. So we have to have a good understanding of this property of matter. Charge can be negative or positive. Charge is a scalar quantity, just like mass is a scalar quantity. The units 
are Coulombs, okay, named after Charles Augustine Coulomb, who was born in 1736, died in 1806. So the unit for charge is a capital C. Just like mass was measured in kilograms, charge is measured in coulombs. Coulombs. Sometimes I say coulombs, but I learned this year it's actually pronounced coulomb. So uh, if you hear me say coulomb, that's because I have a bad habit of mispronouncing this guy's name. Uh, so Q, the equation is Q is equal to any. This is the equation for charge. Okay. The charge is equal to N, the number of elemental particles, either protons or electrons, times the elementary charge, the charge for either one electron, or is it the charge for one proton? So if you have excess protons, it's the number of protons times the charge for one proton. If you have excess electrons, it's the number of electrons times the charge for one electron. So Q is equal to NE. So where is the equation for charge? It's not on the reference table. Okay, but if you want, you could write it on page four. So we're done with page six. Page six is the mechanics one, goodbye. If you want, you could write Q is equal to NE right on the top here. Really, it's just saying the total charge is equal to the number of the tiny electrons times the tiny charge for each electron. So it would be helpful to know how much the charge of one electron is. So where, where is the charge of one electron in Coulombs? It's on the front page of the reference table. So now, yeah, we did page six. We were hyper-focused on page six for like most of the year. We are starting to have to flip around the pages a bunch um, in this unit and the upcoming units. So if we're starting to like learn more about where the things in the reference table are. So one elementary charge is given right here, okay? Here's the lowercase e. And this is the units of charge, coulombs, okay, coulombs. So the charge for one electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's a very small amount of charge, isn't it? Yeah, that's because it's for one electron. If we're talking protons, you still look over here. That's why they call it the elementary charge. They're making it, they should just say like the charge for one electron, charge for one uh, proton, but it's the same. So for a proton, it would be positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs of charge for one proton. What else can we see over here? Okay, check this out. So we have, this is one coulomb right here. So you might have thought, oh, maybe, maybe this is it. Oh, wow, look at that. So they're telling you that one coulomb of charge is equal to this many protons or that many electrons, depending on if it's positive one, then it's this many protons. Look at this, that's a large number of protons, excess protons to have one coulomb of charge. Or maybe it's negative one coulomb. Then you have this many electrons. All right, and this is just a number, so I wouldn't put a negative sign here. This is the amount of electrons. That's how many electrons it takes to get negative one coulombs of charge. So that's how that works. You also have electron volt. We'll do like in modern physics, same with Planck's constant, universal mass unit. This is, again, modern physics. We don't have to worry about that for now. But this might come up, all right? If you were looking for the charge of one electron, you see the word electron here, you think it's this. I see that a lot. No, take a look at the units. This is, again, the mass of an electron. So we can compare the mass of electron to the mass of a proton. Which one is bigger? 
Look, oh, maybe this is bigger. No, no, no. This is very small. The mass of an electron is very small compared to the mass of the proton, but they have the same charge. Okay, so the mass of uh, the charge of an electron is the same as the charge of a proton, but the electron is called negative and the proton is called positive. Uh, the mass of the neutron are the same as the mass of the proton. Cool, cool, cool. So we're just learning more about what is in our reference table here. And we can use that to compare. So again, the charge of an electron, you might have seen it as negative 1e, negative 1 elementary charges. Yeah, that's cool, but we need to know that in terms of coulombs. So that's negative 1.6 times negative times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs of charge, and we got that from the reference table. We also know the mass from the reference table. So these are all given information now. You should know this. So the charge, you don't have to memorize it, but you should know it by looking at the reference table. And I promise you, after doing a bunch of problems, you're definitely going to memorize this number. So again, the charge of a proton in coulombs, same thing, but now it's positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Sometimes I've seen people make this positive because they're like, oh, protons, positive. No, 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 no. It's a small amount of coulombs is the charge for a proton. It's positive over here. The mass, again, mass of a proton is larger than mass of an electron. And for a neutron, what is the charge of a neutron? There is no charge. It's neutral. So zero coulombs, and it's the same mass as a proton. So if an object has a negative charge of negative eight coulombs, how many excess electrons are present in the object? And this is like an actual picture of a piece of amber, classic electrostatic experimental thing that they used. So let's see. We could do, all right, this is negative, so I'll make it blue. So they're telling you some information here. What would you write down? I'm going to write my given information. What is this negative 8C? Negative 8 coulombs is equal to which letter? It's going to be Q. That is the total amount of charge. All right. This is how we do these. It's different now. How many excess electrons are present in the object? How, what is the number of excess electrons? And then the thing that we always know, this is always the same. It's either just positive or negative. So this is the elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's for one. Now we're talking electrons because we know it's an excess of electrons here. So how many electrons give you this much charge? Well, we could use the formula. Q, the total charge, is equal to the number of electrons times the charge for each electron. So this is negative eight coulombs is equal to N times negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right, and then if you would do the division, a couple things happen. So this cancels out, right? The coulombs divided by a coulomb cancel out. So your N is going to be unitless. You don't have to write units for N. It's just the amount of electrons. And the other thing that happens is either the negative divided by a negative is a positive, or if this was a positive charge, then we would put this was positive for the proton. Positive divided by a positive is, a pro is positive. So the way this equation works is you always get a positive amount of charges like because it's just the number of electrons and or the number of excess protons uh, it's not denoting the charge itself so the charge itself is will be negative or positive but the number the amount of excess elementary particles um, is just a number so it doesn't have a positive or negative sign associated with it nor does it have units um, so anyway, you do the division. The other thing is either put this in parentheses or use the capital E button in your calculator and write it like this in your calculator. Uh, otherwise, 
if you don't do that and there it's going to be like this pretty much for the rest of the year we're going to have scientific notation like this so you have to get used to that and i highly recommend using the e button if you didn't pick that up yet um, or just make sure everything's in parentheses every single time anyway you get five times 10 to the 19. now what does this number represent again it's the amount of excess electrons so if it was a neutral object in our model we're just thinking protons and electrons if we have three protons uh, and if you have three electrons then the total charge is zero coulombs it's neutral but we have a negative charge here how many excess electrons is that negative eight coulombs equal to well that means we have 5 times 10 to the 19 excess electrons. So I could try to draw that many electrons, but it's just saying that there's more there's more electrons than protons. I can't draw that many because I would have to draw that many. That's a 5 with 19 zeros after it. That many excess electrons gives you a charge of negative 8 coulombs. But there, that doesn't mean that there's not any protons in the object. There's still protons there but there's just more electrons and protons. That's how this works. Let's do one more example. It says one Faraday of charge is equal to the total charge of one mole of electrons, this many electrons. Um, Michael Faraday was a scientist uh, who did a lot of experiments with electricity. He invented the Faraday cage and there's more information in the extension folder if you wanna check out a cool video about Faraday. Uh, he had his own unit named after him, which is what this question is about. So let's do that. It says, how many coulombs of charge is one Faraday equal to? Well, we know it's that many electrons. So this is the number of electrons we're dealing with. Okay, so this is 6 times 10 to the 23 electrons. You don't have to write this electrons to get credit for units it's just an amount but i'm just using it to explain so how many coulombs of charge is one faraday equal to what is the charge and then again we always know e is the same thing 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs it's just are we talking about electrons or protons well this time we're talking about electrons so we make it negative okay so we can use our formula, Q is equal to NE. So the total charge is equal to the number of excess particles times the charge for each particle. And now you can see, okay, so this is unitless times C. So that's how we get a unit of C. And then this is always going to be positive so it depends on what you make your e is your are you going to plug in negative because we're talking excess electrons or positive because we're talking excess protons again in this case they're talking about electrons so you do and again i would practice uh plugging it in your calculator like this just like that and then you get negative 9.6 times 10 to the 4 and the units for charge are coulombs okay um that's it i do want to do one more thing because some people are still confused after i do all this the examples are kind of crazy um so just as a non-crazy example i'm kind of riffing here but if you had instead you're saying okay how much total charge would three excess uh, protons be so we have three excess protons all right what is the total charge that three excess protons would give you and by the way that would look something like this let's say you have six protons in your nucleus how many electrons would you have only three electrons so we're talking about an excess of, don't you see more protons here? It's definitely not a neutral atom right now. We have three more protons than we do electrons. So that's this situation here. 
I'm just making up the numbers, but I, I, it's all about how many more of one do you have than the other. So in this case, we have three more protons. So what is the overall charge of this atom I just drew? So, and again, E is the same all the time. The magnitude is the same. In this case, we're talking about protons, so we make it positive. The reason they don't give you this formula in the reference table is because when you look at it, you're just taking the number of excess particles and multiplying it by the charge for each particle. It's not anything crazy. It's kind of just like the definition of what charge is. So this is three times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. I hope you can see now what the whole formula kind of means. It's more straightforward. And you still get like a weird number, but it's 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. It's not a whole lot of charge. This is a very small number because we're only talking about three excess protons. And the charge for each proton is very small. Uh, so you're not going to build up as much of a charge um, as opposed to like this is a big amount of charge because we're talking about a lot of excess electrons for that one. So hopefully that makes sense and we have a good base because we're doing electrostatics. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great day.